All right, so section 3.4 is dealing with addition and subtraction, specifically those algorithms, step-by-step -step instructions on how we get there, mental computation, and then just estimating values. So what is an algorithm, first of all? How could we describe it? An algorithm is a lot like a recipe. It tells you exactly what to do when and by how much. So it's a step-by-step -step procedure. Step-by-step. -step procedure for solving a problem. Tells us exactly what to do. So when we start to look at and develop the algorithms for addition and subtraction, it largely relies on manipulatives because those naturally allow students to proceed to those algorithms having worked it out for themselves. So how could we handle, for example, combining together 14 and 23? So first of all, we definitely want to give them a manipulative to work with. So we'll give them base 10 blocks. Base 10 blocks. And what happens with these? So if we set up that concrete model with the base 10 blocks, that's always the first thing that we want to do. We want to set up a concrete model that they can manipulate, that they can work. So what would that look like in this case? I'd like to actually have the manipulatives here, but I can't physically do it on the board. So 14 would look like one long and four units. And 23 would be two longs and three units. So we give them that concrete model. They're able to combine it together. And what are they going to do? Naturally, we're going to group together these longs, the 10 place values. So these represent 10s, these represent 1s. So how many 10s do we have all together? Three of them, so I've got 30. And then we've got 4 and 3 together, we've got 37. So we work from this concrete model to an expanded algorithm. Expanded algorithm. And it basically, it takes this concept and makes it more algebraic. We physically write it down. So if I've got 14 and I'm trying to add 23 to it, much like the students do in the concrete model, we're first going to do what? Add the individual pieces together. D the order doesn't matter. So we could add the ones. And if we add the ones in this case, we've got 4 and 3 together gives us 7. So we can combine the one units, and then we can add together the tens. And we've got two, and another one gives us three, so we have 30 tens. So if we combine those together, we got 37. So we can move from a concrete model to an expanded algorithm, meaning we had to do a couple procedures. Then from there, we can kind of migrate and move to our standard. So lastly, C is the standard. Standard algorithm. When we do each of those individual steps all at one time. So if we've got 14 and 23 together, we can add the ones like we've done, and then add the tens like we've done. But we can do that all in one step. So let's talk about if we had a three digit number. If I've got 186 and 127 together. Obviously, we want to give them a concrete model. So what would it look like in this case? It'd be a lot easier just to have the manipulatives, but we can't always draw it. So in this case, 186. I've got one flat, representing 100, and I've got eight longs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we've got six units. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's our 186 value, 127, I've got one flat, two longs, and seven, five, six, seven units. So when we present this concrete model to students walking through that same process, how are they going to behave? What are they going to do? So first of all, what would our first step be? We always start from the smallest and combine together our units. So can we make up a long? out of just our units. Yes. So the first thing that they're going to do, they're going to add the ones 
and regroup. If I can collect enough ones to make a long, we really want to. So six and seven together gives us 13, which is one long and three units. So we can trade. So we can take out 10 specifically of the units and add on another long. So why don't we do that? So we have to keep three units. So I'm just going to choose one, two, three. And we're trading those, those units, for a long, because we had 10 of them. So now what happens? We've combined all the units. Now can we make a flat 100 out of our factor of these longs? So the second thing to do, we want to add the tens and regroup those until we can't regroup anymore. So how many do we have? We had eight tens from our first number. We had two tens from the second number. And we regrouped and got a third down here, another. So specifically, how many do we have? We've got 11 tens. And 11 tens can produce what? One flat, one 100. So this is one flat and one long. So again, what can happen? We can trade 10 of these. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we get rid of all of these guys, we're going to eight, nine, 10, and we're trading that for a flat. So now that we've combined it in that way, we can add the hundreds and regroup if it's possible. So step three, we want to add the hundreds and regroup. And specifically, what do we have? One, two, three hundreds. So we would need ten hundreds to group into a thousand, and we don't have that. So we're looking at just those three flats. So we've got three hundreds. So to combine all of these now, we've regrouped as far as possible. So what is this sum? What are we looking at? I've got three hundreds. I've got one flat, or excuse me, one long. So I've got three hundreds, one ten, easier way just to say it, and three units. So I should get out three thirteen. So when we move to that standard algorithm, what are we doing when we compute 186 plus 127? We're doing this process, and we've been doing that process for years when we start from the right and combine all the way until we get to the left. So 6 and 7 together gives us what? 13, so we'll have 3 units left over, and we can produce one more long, like we've seen, one long, three units. Then we combine all of those together. So I've got 8, 9, 10, 11 of them. And again, I'll have one long left over, but I can produce one flat, one 100. And how many hundreds do we have? Three of those. So we're doing that same process every single time, much like the students will do with their manipulatives before we move to that standard algorithm. Make it more algebraic and a little bit faster. So let's look at a few different algorithms now, kind of moving away from the base 10 block, manipulatives, and to a more algebraic approach. So this first algorithm that we're going to look at, we call it the left to right algorithm. And we choose to go about it in this way because we read left to right, and it emphasizes the place value of every single digit that's there. So we do have two advantages to this. Students are used to reading from left to right. So we've already got that concept down. And again, it emphasizes the place value. Place value of every single digit when we examine it from left to right. So if we're trying to combine together 568 and 757, if we're trying to combine those, Moving from left to right, we also have to recognize what place value it holds. So my five and my sevens are in the hundredths place. So basically, with the left to right algorithm, we start from left and we move to right. So what are we combining together? 500 and 700. We're looking at those individual digits 
and their place value. So 500 and 700 together gives us 1,200. Then we move over. So now we're dealing with the tens. So we're trying to combine together what? 60 and 50, which gives us 110. And then we move over one more to the units, and we're adding together 8 and 7, which is 15. So now we could combine all of those together. We've got 5 units, we've got 2 tens, 300, and 1,000. So emphasizing the left to right makes them focus on what place value it actually holds. Another way that we could handle this, 568 and 757, is all kind of on one line. We can condense this together. So again, moving from left to right, how does it work? So 5 and 7 together gives us what? 1,200. So we can write that below in the same place value that it holds. But as we move on next to the tens, five and six together gives us 11. So again, same place value, but moving next door, we have to increase that one. And then all the way to the units, seven and eight together gives us 15. So we have five units and we've increased the tens by one. So we're looking at 1325. So both of those get the same idea across. You start from left to right and it emphasizes the place value. We do also have what is called a lattice algorithm where we actually kind of draw in the diagonals that we need to add along. So let's go ahead and add some large numbers, 3,567 and 5,678 together. So what happens with this is we draw in a lattice for our result. So we ever, whenever we have a place value, we're going to draw a vertical in between those. And we're creating a lattice. So then what? We draw in diagonals. And we've created our lattice. And we sum along those diagonals. Sum along the diagonals. And it doesn't matter if we start from left to right or from right to left. The order does not matter. So I'm going to start from right to left just to show you a different variation than our left to right approach, but the same thing will work. So what do we get? 7 and 8 together gives us 15. So again, we have those place values, the 1s and the 10s, and we'll be adding the 10s, the 100s, the 1000s together, adding along the diagonal. So the right hand digit goes on the right, the left hand digit of the number goes on the left or above. We're going to do the same thing here. So 6 and 7 together gives us 13. I've got 1 as my first digit, 3 is the second. 6 and 5 together gives us 11. Both digits are the same. And then 5 and 3, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we have to write it as a two-digit number. So I've got 8 here, and we can put a 0 as a placeholder. Not going to hurt anything. So now what happens? We've done the simple addition down. And now we add along the diagonals. So what do we have? Along this diagonal, we only have the box 5. So that's what it produces. We have 5 units. 3 and 1 together gives us 4. 1 and 1 together gives us 2. 8 and 1 gives us 9. So we've got 9,245. The next algorithm is called the scratch algorithm. Scratch algorithm. And this one is also called the low stress, low stress algorithm. And we've got a few examples for it, just to demonstrate what happens. So let's combine together 87, 65, and 49. And we'll also take a look at 43, 78, and 95 together. And then lastly, we've got 29, 32, 74, and 10. Just to add four of those. So let's start all the way on the left. What happens in this case? Starting in the ones, we're going to go up until we hit a 10. Then we're going to make a scratch mark to indicate a 10. So every single scratch mark, scratch marks indicate a 10. 
indicate that we've produced a 10. So on this version, when we add 7 and 5 together, what does it produce? 12. So I got a 10. So we have a scratch mark through that digit, and now we had how many left over? 2, because it produced 12. So now we combine these together. 2 and 9 together gives us 11, so we had another 10, and we had a remainder of 1. So now what happens? How many scratch marks did we have? Two of them. So we have to write on top, hey, I had two that were produced from the previous computations that we need to take into account. And now as we add these, 2 and 8 together, we've got a factor 10. We had a remainder, 0. 0 and 6 together gives us 6. We haven't gotten a 10. 6 and 4 together gives us 10, and we had a remainder of 0. So now when we go down to actually count how many 10s were produced in this case, what do we have? 2. So I've got two scratch marks, some of those 201. Let's practice again on two more just to see again what happens. Every scratch mark indicates a 10. So 3 and 8 together, we surpass 10 by how much? We have a remainder of 1. And 1 and 5 together, we have 6. So how many scratch marks did we have? Just one to take into account, moving into the next placed value. And now as we add these ones together, 1 and 4 together gives us 5. We haven't hit a 10 there. 5 and 7 together gives us 12. So we scratch and we got a remainder of 2. And then 9 and 2 together gives us another factor of 10. And the remainder is what? 1. So again, moving into the hundreds now, how many scratch values do we have? 1, 2 of them. So that produced 216. And let's look a little bit, uh, look again at a little bit larger example to understand what goes on. Again, starting from the upper right. 9 and 2 together, we hit 10. We surpass it by 1. 1 and 4 together gives us 5. 5 and 0, we still have 5. We had one scratch mark, so we'll make note of that. 1 and 2 together gives us 3. 3 and 3 gives us 6. 6 and 7 gives us 13. 3 and 1, we have a remainder of 4 there. How many scratch marks do we have? One of them, 145. So it is a low stress algorithm because we're kind of working right where we are and physically making note of the factors of 10 that produce. So we covered a little bit of addition, developing those algorithms. Let's do the same for subtraction. So subtraction with our concrete blocks, subtraction trying to build to an algorithm, but typically we'll stick with base 10 blocks first, so we can build a concrete example, then build to an expanded algorithm and to a standard algorithm that we're used to seeing. If we were going to take 243 and remove 61, in terms of blocks, what would it look like? So specifically, what do we have here? We have two flats, two 100s, We've got four longs, four tens, and we've got three units. And we could draw them all and actually manipulate with them. That would be the best route to go, but again, we're limited here. In 61, what does that look like? We don't have any flats, but we have six longs, and we have one unit. So now, in order to take 243 and remove out six longs and one unit, what's going to have to happen? So we don't have enough longs inside of our 243 to remove six of them. So we're going to have to do a little bit of converting. So moving up a place value into our hundreds, the flats, we have to convert one of these. So one flat we're going to take out, and that's going to produce how many longs for us? Ten longs. So we had to convert. And now what happens? Now we're allowed to remove six longs. So currently, how many flats do we have? I have one flat. In other words, 100. And how many longs do we have together? I've got 10 of them that we just produced from breaking up the flats, and we had four from our original value. So I have 14, and when we remove six of them, how many are going to be left? We're going to have eight longs, and then we had three units from our first number, and we're moving one of them, so we have two units left. Two units and eight longs means we're dealing with 80. So when we add all of those together, what is the value that we're looking at? 182. 
Another way to look at these subtractions is what's called an equal additions algorithm. Equal additions. Additions algorithm. So what this allows us do, to do is to take two values and kind of move them up to values that we're more comfortable with. Convert them, I guess you could say. So for example, I've got 93 and I'm trying to take away 27 from that value. So 93, it would be nice if that was either 90 or 100. Whole values to work with and we don't have to deal with so many units. So in order to take 93 and get us up to 100, since we're dealing with the equal additions, it would also work for subtractions. What do we have to do? To get 93 up to 100, we have to add 7 to it. And whatever I do to one, I have to do to the other because it has to be equal on all parts. So 27, I also have to add 7 units to that. So instead of computing specifically 93 minus 27, now we can look at computing 100 minus what? 34. And that's a little bit more reasonable. Still, we're going to get the same value because what I did to the other, what I did to one, I did to the other. Still going to produce what? 66. So we have the ability to do that. And why would we want to? Especially if we're trying to do this mentally, it's a lot easier to compute with a nicer value out front and even on the back. So we're going to use this a lot when we're dealing with mental computations. And we have a whole unit dedicated to this inside of this section. And as well as estimations. We can get a rough idea of what something is going to be around without actually doing the nitty gritty computations. So the next common core standard that we're going to be dealing with, we have to allow our students to be able to assess the reasonableness. Reasonable of an answer. And even in my algebra classes today, I want my students, you know, higher education students to be able to do this as well. Is the result that we possess actually reasonable or did we make a mistake somewhere? So let's look at some mental computations and the first thing we're going to deal with, mentally doing addition. Mental addition. What does it look like? We've got a lot of different things to cover, lots of different ways that we can do this. So let's look at the first. First, we want to be adding from the left. It's just one way to get it done. So, for example, if we're combining 67 and 36 together. In this case, what are we looking at? Starting from the left, we're adding the tens together. What do we have? 60 and 30 together gives us 90. We first add the tens. Then, combining together just the units. 7 and 6 together gives us 13. And that was adding the ones. And when we combine those together, what do we have? 103. So mentally computing it in that way, breaking it up into the tens and the ones gets us there. Same story if we had, for example, 36 plus 36. So if we double 30, what do we get? We get 60, combining those together. If we double 6, it produces 12. So what do we have? 72, combining those together. Another way to look at it would be what's called breaking it up. So breaking up and then bridging. Breaking up and bridging. So let's take the same example, 67 and 36. So this is basically the same as adding from the left, but we break it up in a little bit larger of a chunk. So 67, we can combine that together with the other tens value of 30, and that's going to produce 97. Then we can take 97, and the only thing that we haven't combined from these is 6 units. So if we add 6 units onto that, what do we get? Same thing, 103. So we can break it up in a different way into larger chunks and combine them together. Third, what's called trading off. 
Taking that same example, we've got 67 and 36. Another thing that we could do is build up our first value to a nice whole round number. So for example, to get 67 up to 70, how many units do we need to borrow, trade off from 36? Three of them. So 67 plus 3 gives us 70. So I've computed 70, and now how many units do we have remaining from 36? We had to borrow three of them. So 36 minus 3, we've got 30. Combining those ones together, we get the same value, 103. It's just whatever you are comfortable with. Let's take another one of those, 67, and let's go ahead and add 29 to it. So in this case, 67, we dealt with it before, we could add 3 and get up to 70, but 29 is really close to what? Really close to 30. It only differs by 1. So what is 67 plus 30? What do we get in that case? 97. And again, we added one extra unit inside of there. So 97 minus that one value, we've got 96 living there. So another way to think about it. We could even add on an extra to deal with a nicer number, then remove it back out at the end. And number four, we don't really have a name for this one. I guess we could call it kind of grouping. Grouping. Grouping together things that are nice, things that will produce nice values. So if I'm trying to add 130, 50, 70, 20, and another 50, we can pair these and group them together so that it produces nice values. For example, 130 and 70 together gives us 200. So we can group those together. 50 and 50 together gives us 100. Then we have this leftover 20. So currently, what are we sitting at? I've got 200 and another one will give me 300. 300 plus another 20, so we're looking at 320. So we can always group mentally compute them a little bit quicker when we do it in that way. Last thing, number five, we can make making compatible sums. Compatible sums. And what would this look like? Good examples, 25 plus 79. 25 and 75 produce a really nice result, so we could start there. 25 and 75 together gives us 100. And how many units were not accounted for inside of our 79? Four more of them. So 100 plus another 4, we get a total of 104. So we can do it in that way as well. So we considered mental addition. We should also look at mental subtraction. And it's very similar to what we've just seen. So let's consider mental subtraction now. First case, very similar to what we've just seen. We're going to be breaking up, breaking up, and bridging. Very similar to what we've just seen. So let's take our example 67 and remove 36 from it. So we can break up 36 and just deal with removing 30 right off the bat. So 67 minus 30, we get 37. And how many units have we not taken care of and removed? Six more, so 37 minus 6. We get a total of 31 from the difference. Another similar case is trading off. For example, if we've got 71 minus 39, 39 is really close to 40. It would be a lot easier to deal with. So we can add the same number to the top and the bottom and compute that equivalent subtraction. So 71 plus 1, we've got 72. And 39 plus 1, we're looking at 40. So we could instead look at the difference between 72 and 40 to compute 71 minus 39. Because in this case, what do we get? 32. A little bit easier to see, easier to visualize. Number 3. We could drop the zeros, basically scaling by multiples of 10. For example, if we've got 8,700 and we're trying to remove off 500 from that, we can go ahead and drop two zeros and compute 87 minus 5, which is just 82. 
And then since we removed two factors of zero, we have to introduce them at the end. So 82 is going to be converted into 8200. A little bit easier to comprehend when we simplify it down, drop the zeros, and then add them back on at the end. The last example, um, Common Core math is kind of birthed from this concept, I think. When I have students or teachers or just parents in general come up to me and say, well, what do you think about the Common Core? This is the typical example that I give them. And it's called the giving change or the cashier's algorithm. Because back before we had cell phones and calculators built into everything, we had to do everything by hand. So let's just say you went to the grocery store and you owe the clerk $11. You bought $11 worth, worth of groceries, but you give the attendant a $50 bill. So basically, how do we compute how much change the person is receiving? So the change is going to be typically described in this order. We start from 11, we move up to what? 12, 13, 14, 15, giving back ones until we get to a multiple of 5. Then what? Give them a 5, we get to 20. Give them a 10, we get to 30. Give them a 20, we get up to 50. So we do it in that way. 11 and a dollar makes 12, 13, 14, 15, and a 5 makes 20, a 10 makes 30, a 20 makes 50. So let's count the actual change that we're receiving back. So what did we receive? Starting from 11, we got a dollar, another dollar, another dollar, another dollar, a 5, a 10, and a 20. So we've got 20, 35, 6, 7, 8, 39 dollars. So here's a few for you to try. Perform these mentally and explain your technique. So specifically, how did you go about combining these together? So the first example, there's lots of different ways, lots of variations that this can be completed. But specifically, this is what I did. I combined the first two together because that's a nice value of 200. And then I combined together the last two. So what do we have in that case? 50 and another 10 gives us 60. So we're dealing with 260. So we kind of grouped together and made nicer values uh, to combine. Part B in this case, lots of different ways we can do it. I'm going to go ahead and take this value and subtract off just 400. So we deal with that place value first, and then we'll look at 74. So 3679 minus 400 is going to be 3279. And we still have to remove off how many? 74 units from that value. So if I remove 74, we're looking at 32 and 05, 32,000, 3,205. Part C, in this case, what do you notice? 28 has a factor of 25 living inside of it. So 75 and 25 together gives us 100. And how many units have we not taken into account inside of 28? Three more, so we're dealing with 103. And then uh, lastly, we can hack off the zeros and deal with 25 minus 7, which gives us 18. We hacked off two zeros, so at the end we have to add on two zeros. We get 1,800. So there's, again, lots of different ways uh, that your brain works, that we can compute these. This is just one route to go. So let's look at computational estimation. So instead of dealing with the specific values that we're looking at, can we kind of adjust the values so that the numbers are nicer and we have a good idea of what the actual computation is going to be around? So the first example that we're going to look at, we're going to look at front end with adjustment. So if we're trying to combine together 423, 338, and 561. If we're trying to combine all of those. We look at the front end, the first place values, and combine those together. So 4, 3, and 5, we're dealing with what? 12, and they sit in the hundreds place. 
1,200. And the values after that, we can approximate them. So 23 is pretty close to 20. We can estimate it. 38 and 61 together is pretty darn close to what? 100. So I have these 1,200 factors, and I'm also combining another 120 onto that. So what is our estimate? The estimate for these values, I've got 1,200, and I'm adding on 120, so we are looking at 1,320. A rough estimate of what this thing is going to be around. Very similar to our mental computations, we can also group grouping to nice numbers. For example, if we're combining 23, 39, 32, 64, and 49 together. Can we group these in such a way that they're pretty darn close to a nicer number to work with? So in this case, what are we looking at? 39 and 64, pretty darn close to approximately 100. And then what haven't we taken care of? We got 23, 32, and 49. If we combine all three of those, those together are about 100, approximately 100. So our rough estimate for the combination of these values is approximately what? Approximately 200. Again, we could calculate specifically, but we're just trying to get a good estimation. Number three. This one is called clustering. What a great word. And it basically just says what is the average that all of these numbers are around. Where do they cluster? So, for example, 6200, 5842, 6512, 5521, and 6319. If we're trying to add all of those together. On average, where do these values cluster? So what value do they average close to? They cluster around what? About 6,000, give or take. If we were to average all of them, some of them are over, some of them are under. So roughly 6,000, and how many times, how many factors of 6,000 do we actually have? One, two, three, four, five of them. Six times five gives us 30, and we have three factors of zero to add onto the back. So we've got a 30,000 estimate. And it's important to write that word on there or use the approximately equal to symbol because it's not exactly equal to. We didn't compute straightforward, we're just estimating what it's going to be around. Number four, we're going to look at rounding. And we're all pretty familiar with this concept. We look at the place value to the right of it. If it's larger or equal to 5, we round up. If it's less than 5, we round down. So again, if we haven't seen that rule in a while, if the place value we're examining to the right of it is greater than or equal to 5, we round up. Otherwise, we round down. So let's go ahead and add together 4,724 and 3,192. So let's go ahead and look at the thousands, first of all, and look at rounding those. So 4,700, we're looking at rounding to the thousandths place. To the right of it is a 7, which is larger than 5, so we round up. So we can round this one up to 5,000, rounding to the thousandths. And then 3,000 to the right of it is less than 5, so we're going to round down and hack off the rest of it. That thing is closer to 3,000. So just from the thousands, when we round, we're estimating the sum of just these two to be about 8,000. So now we can examine another example, like if we're trying to round to the hundreds. So instead, let's add 1267 and 510. So before we were focusing on this place value, now we're going to be focusing on the hundreds, hundreds, instead. So when we look at 1267, the hundreds place to the right of it is larger than 5, so we round up. We can round this up to 1300. 
500. When we look to the right of this digit, we have a 1, which is less than 5, so we round down, hack off the rest of that value. A ref estimate for this sum is going to be what? 1,800. Last thing to consider is called a range or a span that these numbers can actually be over. And we figure it out by figuring out a low estimate, the lowest estimate, and the highest, highest estimate. And that produces a range that our actual computation can fall within. So for example, this is our problem. Let's go ahead and take 378 and add 524 to it. We're going to find a low estimate and a high estimate, finding the range. So a low estimate would be what? Our numbers, we're dealing with hundreds, so let's round to the hundreds place. Low estimate for this guy, 300. Low estimate for 524, 500. So our low estimate together, 800. Very low. And a high estimate, again, if we're focusing on the hundred place value, 378, if we round up, we're dealing with 400. 524, if we round up, we're dealing with 600. So we've got a lower bound of 800 and an upper bound of 1,000. So we have an estimated range from 800 to 1,000. So I hope you could tolerate a couple lessons from the Lightroom. Enjoy Halloween, spending time with your family and your little ones. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, on Thursday, be sure to be working on these kinds of problems. Email me if you have any questions.